edition back in January, February. Um, this one is on is a biomechanical study. Look at the influence of screw diameter and number on reduction loss after plating of distal radius fractures. Um, that name is somewhat of a misnomer, um, as we'll get to when we look at the actual paper. So as a bit of an introduction, distal radius fractures are very common. Uh, they're one of the most common fractures um, in, in humans. Um, they're seen, US figures show 9 per 10,000 uh, male years and 36 per 10,000 female years. Um, and there has been increasing tendency, um, and something that most people in this room will even appreciate, over the last 10 years, uh, looking at the move towards operative management of these fractures. And that's um, despite still a surprising lack of evidence and certainly a, a great lack of level one evidence um, actually comparing operative and non-operative management of these fractures. Um, so the way they've been managed operatively is by essentially dorsal and volar locking plates. Um, the advantage of a locking plate is that the stability comes not from the friction of the plate on the bone, um, but from the solid uh, screws or pegs being locked into the plate and then providing a solid construct, meaning that for anything to, to move, either the plate has to entirely pull out of the bone um, or, or the material of the plate has to fail. So the first generation of these were single distal screw rows and had monoaxial locking options only. Um, and the latest generation, and certainly something we use at the Western, uh, have multiple distant screw rows and polyaxial locking. Um, and there's surprisingly, as I said, little evidence looking at the, the differentiation between these two generations as well as between non-operative and operative management. Um, why do we fix these? Well, the, the principle of, is to reduce the fracture appropriately. Um, the quality of the reduction um, and remaining dorsal angulation um, correlates directly with uh, range of motion and function um, and return to normal activities. Uh, following the injury. So, as I said, this is a biomechanical study. They analysed six different plates. Um, doing this got 24 synthetic uh, radii um, and tried to stimulate a C2, AO23 C2 fracture. Um, this was not entirely correct. What they did was actually a wedge osteotomy uh, dorsally um, to take out the section which in an AO C22 fracture would be the comminuted area, um, and then created a essentially a sagittal split down uh, there, as you can see in the, the top one of those two pictures. Um, the six plates used were two hopper plates, which I had not come across before, uh, a plate called the ITS Prolock, um, two synthes plates uh, being the SYN35 with three 3.5 mil screws distally, uh, this SYN24, uh, with five um, 2.4 mil screws distally, and the striker variax distal radius system, um, which we all know very well. Um, the in terms of how they applied these plates, um, no specific details were given beyond saying that they applied them as per the manufacturer's instructions, um, with the consideration that as the author has shown in, a, in another paper and supported by many papers, um, that. Reduction loss is decreased and stability increased by having the distal screws as close as possible to, to subchondral bone. Um, once these plates were applied uh, to six sets of four, four synthetic radia, um, a mould was taken of the articular surface using bone cement, um, and this was then used essentially as a stamp so that the force being applied to test the, the, test the reduction and fixation um, was one through the essentially the articular surface of the radius uh, to stimulate pressure from the scaphoid bones. There, the the image of the six plates. There, starting from the Hoffer two plates. The difference between the two being uh, the Hoffer green plate on the far left using cortical screws uh, distally, and the red using cancellous screws distally. Um, which is a little bit different. Um, the ITS plate, the striker one there, and then the two synthes plates. They didn't have in this series the newer um, synthes plate um, that's been seen around. In terms of distal screw rows, um, you can see the numbers there. Hopefully they're coming up on the, on the larger screen. Um, the total number of distal screws is also shown. Um, I'm not driving that arrow. I, 
Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as, um, so then we go to the locking type. It's my kind assistant will now point out. Um, it shows uh, that the four top plates, the Hoffer one, the ITS and the Struck, use a polyaxial locking mechanism. Um, and the two synthes plates used in this study used a monoaxial locking system. So how is the testing done? The parameters they looked at were rigidity, uh, deformation, and then the tilt angle. Um, this was done in two stages. Firstly, by cyclical testing, uh, 2,000 cycles uh, at a frequency of 1 hertz, applying 800 newtons to the distal radius. Um, this has been shown to be, this has been validated, this style of testing for these sort of, this sort of fracture reduction and fixation in previous studies by this author and others. Um, essentially, the thinking being that for every 10 newtons of grip force, you're applying 26 to 52 newtons of force um, against the articular surface of the radius. So we know that a maximal grip force is around 3,300 uh, newtons. Um, so this application of 800 newtons correlates to about, sort of about 100 to 200 newtons of force. Um, grip strength, um, which is what one would expect in the initial period following a radius fracture. Um, obviously, by the time that someone has achieved um, or getting close to their full grip strength back, they're at a point in their rehabilitation time-wise that means that the bone is then further on healed and providing fixation. Finally, the plates were then tested till failure. Um, so 10 millimetres of force or 10 millimetres of per minute were applied um, until the construct failed. What was measured was motion at the osteotomy gap. Um, inductive motion sensors were applied to the radial and ulnar fragments of the fracture, um, in addition to a reference one on the proximal segment. Um, and then video extensiometry was applied to detect motion between the plate and screw construct um, and the bone itself. Um, so, the analysis used a one-way test um, to assess whether the variance between constructs was due to chance. Um, they chose an alpha of 0 0.05. Um, this is backed up with a two-key honesty significance difference test, um, which looks <laughs> at... Thanks. Uh, yeah, two key, and I did check this spelling. Um, honestly, significance test, which looks at um, the comparing the means and looking at the variability across them. Um, what the purpose of these first two tests um, is to ensure that the differences were statistically significant, um, and this was true for all of them, um, according to the paper, apart from the the sagittal deformation scene. Um, multivariate linear regression was then used to look at the independent effects of the plate and screw parameters, assuming that there was a linear relationship between them. Before we look at the actual numbers, the papers reported these results. So they actually chose, and this is why I said that the, the name of the paper is a slight misnomer. Um, they talk about diameter um, and its of screws and its effect on fixation. What they actually were doing is creating this, this arbitrary number called the projectional area, um, which was the product of the diameter of the distal screws used um, and the number of distal screws used. So with the synthes 3.5 plate, um, that would be 3.5 being the diameter of the screw times 3 being the distal screw. So that actually had the smallest projectional area in comparison to say the synthes 24 plate which has 2.4 times times 5. Um, I'm not, I can't quite find in the literature where they got that, that arbitrary figure from. Um, so they said that this projectional area had a positive influence on rigidity of the construct um, in both cyclical text, uh, testing and, and load to failure testing. Um, a negative effect, also a, a good outcome on the tilting angle um, and a positive effect on the total load that the construct could withstand. The number of distal screws um, was positively correlated with the tilting angle as well um, and had a positive effect on rigidity. And then they looked at some load to failure figures, which we'll look at now. Now this, um, 
again, due to the formatting, is not coming up particularly well. Um, there's a few things that are slightly questionable in their data. So if we look at the on cyclical testing, the tilting angle, um, their assertion that the tilting angle is related to the projectional area of the distal screws. Um, there's a, sorry, the total number of distal screws. Um, the 95% confidence interval is 0 0.03 to 2.25, which is quite a quite a wide gap. And with down at that 0 0.03, if they'd extend that out to a 98% confidence interval or use a different alpha value in their testing, that may not have been statistically significant. Um, likewise, uh, with the the maximum uh, rigidity, uh, sorry, the rigidity on load to failure testing, um, and that was in, with regards to the projectional area of the distal screws. Um, they had a confidence interval of between two and 406, um, which again is is very very wide, um, and that that gives a p of 0 0.048, which shows that perhaps that's that's a questionable significance as well. Looking at the results between the the different plates. Um, so the Synthes 35 plate with the three distal screws of 3.5 mil diameter performed the most poorly, um, having the lowest rigidity on both cyclical and load to failure testing, um, and and a significant amount of tilting angle being 2.9 degrees. Surprisingly, if we look at the the striker system which we use at Western, most often um, that didn't do as well as some as some of the other plates on some of the criteria used in this study. Um, a rigidity of 598 uh, newtons per millimetre, which was the second least of the six on cyclical testing, um, and had the greatest amount of tilting angle, um, being 6.13 degrees on the cyclical testing. Um, so what does the paper go on to say in discussion? Well, they, they point out that they assert that more distal screws uh, means for a higher rig high rigidity of the end construct. Um, a smaller projectional area leads to more angulation um, and less rigidity. Uh, they state that the number of screw rows is not significant. Um, that said, there's no analysis to actually back that up and control for the other variables. And um, obviously, the, the number of screw rows is quite linked to the number of screws used, and they haven't actually separated those two, those two out. Um, the distal screws should buttress against subchondral bone. Well, that's been demonstrated in many studies, both in vivo and, and uh, biomechanical ones in the past. Um, so there are several limitations of this paper. Um, some are pointed out by the paper itself, being that this is a synthetic model. Uh, this author, being Drobitz, has um, conducted studies um, published in, in specific hand and orthopedic journals before um, in both and synthetic radii and cadaveric studies um, and some outcome-based studies in patients. Um, but the feeling was in this study they wanted to control for any, any variability in the um, cadaveric specimens, so went with the synthetic model. Uh, there's no analysis of monoaxial versus polyaxial locking, um, and they do comment on this. Um, I had a cursory literature search, and there's not actually a lot around looking at the, the biomechanics of these locking constructs being introduced to these systems. Um, and I've just made the comment there that potentially this this could contribute to the striker plate's poor performance, being it's got that quite different um, polyaxial locking mechanism um, in it. So that's potentially something that needs to be looked at um, at a sort of evidence-based level. Um, there's many variables not taking into consideration. So they're comparing six different plates with six different distal screw configurations, some between three and six distal screws, between one and two rows, um, applying them in, in using different techniques. And although they, they state that there are, they apply them as per the manufacturer's instructions, um, Craig pointed out today that they're actually quite different looking at them there. Um, certainly some are applied a lot more proximally than others. Um, and that Synthes one looks like the middle screw is potentially going through one of the, the fracture lines, um, probably not helping things. Um, so there are lots of variables not taken into consideration and the data provided doesn't adequately um, reassure that they have taken, they have control for all these different variables. Um, there's no static stress versus strain analysis and that's sort of considered a um, 